Um, good morning. Morning. <laughs> it's really great to be given the opportunity to speak to you, and on Palm Sunday as well, off the back of the worship that we've just had, and the messages as well, it's kind of uh, done my job for me, which is, um, which is good. But actually, I, I think it's, you can, we can laugh about that, but it's God speaking to us as well. Um, and so Palm Sunday was different 2,000 years ago, very, very different to what we have here. But what the people were doing was her- were heralding in the King of Jerusalem, and that's what we've done today. Um, and it's, it's just a great blessing to be a part of that. I've got two abiding memories of Palm Sunday, um, although having been brought up in church, of course, I've got 28 memories of Palm Sunday, but two that, two that stick with me. Most recent was a couple of years ago. Um, we were offloaded from a flight in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia, and we spent, although it wasn't our Palm Sunday because it was the Orthodox calendar, but we spent Palm Sunday in the capital city of Ethiopia, and it was quite an adventure. Because it was a bank holiday, everything was closed. We had no luggage, so we had the clothes that we were in, and that was it. We had no toiletries. Um, We managed to coerce a member of staff from the hotel. Coerce sounds bad. We just asked them a lot. Um, If they would open up the the shop um, so that we could at least buy some toothbrushes and and things like that. Um, And they obliged and promptly liberated us of about £25 for a toothbrush and a can of deodorant. So uh, that was a real blessing. Um, but, but all, you know, we, we laugh, but all the restaurants and all the hotels and all the shops when they were open all had palm leaves across the floor. Um, they're completely covered. It was quite an amazing thing to see and to be a part of. My second memory uh, is of being in Zambia, and at the time I must have been about 10 years old. Um, we just moved out to Zambia. It was our first Easter there. And somebody had the bright idea of recreating the Palm Sunday celebrations in church with palm leaves. So mum and a friend from the church set off, I don't know where they went, but they got a car full of palm branches. And as we were getting ready for this and people were preparing for it, somebody made the useful observation that hundreds of palm leaves being waved in a building can be quite dangerous to the eyes. So Saturday evening before Palm Sunday, we sat for hours and trimmed all the sharp edges (laughs) off the palm leaves so they could be waved with, with abandon the next day. Um, and they were, they were. It was, it was, it's, it's something that stuck with me. It's, um, uh, it was really. Str- I was ten years old. I didn't really know why we were doing this. All I knew was that this was, this was a pretty good vibe, and I was enjoying it. And I think, when I was remembering that earlier this week, it's kind of like the crowd. You know, they, they didn't really know what the rest of the week held, but this is a big deal. Like something's going on. Something that we want to be a part of is going on. And so, we come to. Palm Sunday all those years ago. Palm Sunday is uh, dictated in all four Gospels. I'm going to read it from Matthew 21 again. So if I could have my first slide, please. I'm only kidding, I haven't got one. Uh, (laughs) um, Matthew 21, verse 1 to 11. (laughs) Please forgive me. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them. Can't argue with that. And he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their, clo- their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. There is so much to unpack in the Easter story. And the danger that we can sometimes, the trap that we can sometimes fall into, is looking at Easter weekend and not the Holy Week. And so I'm really conscious that we focus today on looking at Palm Sunday. Obviously, it's all part of the same event, but actually, I want to have a look at particularly Palm Sunday. 2,000 years ago, people gathered for the original. The most powerful king who has ever lived was about to enter Jerusalem. 
They threw down all that they had, their cloaks. Those that didn't have cloaks cut down palm leaves and lay them down. People clamored to do all they could to honor the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And the crowd grows quicker and quicker as more and more people hear about who this man is. And Jesus, on his donkey, sets his face knowing what is to come. Over the sound of the crowd cheering and the celebrating and all that's going on, the cross casts a shadow. I think the biggest mistake we can make when it comes to looking at Palm Sunday is to overlook it as a minor event, given everything that follows shortly after. Actually, Palm Sunday sets in motion Holy Week, a week like no other, a week that would change all of humanity, a week that changes our relationship with God, a week that would ultimately save you and I. Amen. 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 Yeah. The Easter story is a bit like a coming storm, I feel. When we lived in Zambia, uh, during the rainy season from October onwards, you could, sort of November time, the storms would fall into a nice, predictable pattern. And towards the end of the day, you'd get this oppressive heat, headaches, and it would be muggy and humid, and then the clouds would start to gather, and it would get darker, and it would, it would almost be like sunset, but it was just sort of early evening. And then you'd start to see some flashes of lightning, and you'd slowly start to hear the, 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 the slow, quiet rumble of thunder, and then the rain would start, and it would just be big raindrops, but they would just every few seconds would hit the tin roof, and there'd be a pitter patter, and... Uh, When that started, you knew that you'd be on the point of no return. This storm is coming, and it's going to be big. Palm Sunday is a bit like those first raindrops. Jesus, his teaching career, if you like, um, probably not the best words, uh, are based on this upside-down kingdom, a kingdom that doesn't conform to the world that we live in. The idea that instead of getting revenge on people, you forgive them, as we've, we've just heard. The idea that you are your richest when you give everything away. And the idea that you get great honor when you serve people is completely countercultural to what was going on at the time and is countercultural to what we understand of our world now. And Palm Sunday is those first big raindrops of this coming storm. Matthew writes in his gospel about how Jesus arrives and he announces the kingdom of God, the Sermon on the Mount. He has this new, uh, it's not a new idea, but he is bringing it forward as a new idea, this new kingdom. Um, And then in subsequent chapters, Matthew tells stories of Jesus' miracles. So Jesus comes and he announces this new kingdom. But then in his life following that, he shows people what it means for them. What does the kingdom of God mean for you? It means healing for lepers. It means the blind will see. It means forgiveness. It means redemption. It means relationship with God. And what it does is it takes away from this sort of religious weight that is on people's shoulders. And it gives them back a relationship and a fellowship with their loving God. And inevitably, it awakens a response from the general public because it's different. For some, there is no doubt that he must be the Messiah. It's clear in front of them. And yet for others, he is the furthest thing from the Messiah. He's a blasphemer. He's a liar. He's a fraud. In the words of the famous film Life of Brian, he's not the Messiah. He's a very naughty boy. And those are the two groups of people that we have. And the image is... One that I've shared before, but this idea that we've got two kingdoms running completely parallel. You have the status quo, you have the order of the day, you have what we understand, the way our world works. And then parallel to that, you have the kingdom of God. One that has been announced to people, and not only has it been announced and talked about, but it's been brought into their lives. This crowd have seen it. Some of this crowd have been healed. These crowd, some of these crowd have seen Lazarus, Lazarus raised from the dead. They have seen this new kingdom, and it's running parallel to what they understand as the the, the order of the day or how we want to keep things. Um, In 2008, I think it was, Sebastian Vettel won his first Formula One race in in Italy, and the commentator said, went off on this great little monologue, it's become quite a famous thing, but he says, a Toro Rosso driven by a 21-year-old hot shoe with a great sense of humor who just makes you love Formula One all over again is about to take his first Grand Prix victory. You've got to be careful likening Jesus to Sebastian Vettel. But in my mind, that's kind of, if if we were commentating on this story, that's kind of the commentary that we would have. We have the status quo, and yet parallel to that, we have this new kingdom of God. A kingdom of God that is concerned with relationship with people, with fellowship between God and his people. It's dynamic, it's new, and it's all about God's people falling in love with him again and being able to have that fellowship and getting them out from underneath this religious burden. 
And then on Palm Sunday, these two kingdoms collide. The first raindrops of the storm that I mentioned earlier. And that is Holy Week, or the beginning of Holy Week. And that's my introduction. (laughs) There's a lot to take away from Palm Sunday. And my first point centers around the donkey. Possibly one of the oddest exchanges in the Bible. Um, It's one that's always kind of made me smile. Um, Jesus asked two disciples to go and get him a donkey. Reasonable request. And if anybody questions why they are stealing a donkey, he is just to say that the the Lord has sent them and that will be A-OK. Nobody can argue with that. Odd as it may be, this little aside is fulfilling prophecies that were, that were written hundreds and hundreds of years prior. We read it in, um, it's in, in Zechariah, but the, the, the prophecy says, Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on, the, uh, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this little strange story that we're not quite sure how to take is fulfilling prophecies written hundreds and hundreds of years ago. It's the fruition of the promises of God that were laid out all those years before to the prophets. The disciples would have known the old scriptures. They would have had a good working understanding of them. But with all that was going on, it's highly likely that they weren't quite sure how this fitted into things. And yet they kind of just, I I don't know what the full exchange was, but they kind of blindly go along with it. And they're like, yeah, that makes perfect sense. Can't argue with that. And they go along and they get this donkey. They did what Jesus told them to do, and in doing so, fulfilled the promises of God laid out hundreds of years prior. These promises weren't fulfilled by them being great scholars or theologians, not that those are bad things, of course, but these promises were fulfilled by them being close to Christ and obedient to what he was saying. Palm Sunday reminds us that being close to Christ is the key to the fulfillment of God's promises. We won't fulfill them by becoming theologians. Again, that's not a bad thing. But, by stud, uh, but rather by being close and obedient to Christ. My second point. The crowd on that day brought whatever they had. Um, a few days after the, the, the Queen Elizabeth passed away, Meg and I travelled down to London um, to, to, to kind of, you know, just to, to be there and, and see the atmosphere. And there was a huge queue down the mall. And it was moving relatively slowly. And then all of a sudden it just stopped. And it stopped moving for about an hour and a half. And we were just kind of stood there, you know. Uh, Somebody threw up. It was was just a mess. But we were, you know. And we tried to find out what was going on. But what had happened was they were waiting for a movement of the king. And so as we stood there and waited, you know, everybody was there with their flowers. And, you know, there was this, this sort of like... Uh, a, a buzz in the air. And then the first police motorbike started coming through and then the motorcade and then the armed police and then, and then came the king's car and all the other cars and then followed it was uh, various Range Rovers and all that sort of stuff. And then after that, we were able to go through. On this day for this king, there's none of that, there's no motorcade, there's none of that, um, that pomp uh, that you would expect when a king is arriving. And yet, this is a king who would change The world. The crowd just bring what they have. Those who have cloaks to lay down, lay their cloaks down. Those who don't, cut branch leaves from the, uh, palm leaves from from the trees. They lay them down. Those that don't have either of those, just simply cry out, Hosanna. Palm Sunday reminds us that we are just called to, to honor Jesus as we are. To just bring what we have. We don't have to do anything. We don't have to jump through hoops. We just have to honour him as King of Kings and Lords of, Lord of Lords. And when we do that, we herald him into Jerusalem triumphantly. My third point is um, talking about the nature of the, the, the crowd. The crowd's a really interesting one in this story. And before I go into it, we've taken a break from what we've called the Jesus Masterclass. Um, This is a slight aside, and we're going to go back to it after Easter, which is really funny to say that we've taken a break from it, because you can't really understand what being a follower of Christ really means if you don't take into account Easter. But this is is an aside. And sometimes we, uh, you know, it might be a chance to breathe a sigh of relief, because some of those Jesus Masterclass lessons have been really challenging. You know, we've heard stories, Jack's brought a story about how challenging this has been. And now we get to Easter, you think, oh, great, we're going to have a few weeks off and then, then back to the tough stuff. 
The crowd on that day shouted, Hosanna, Hosanna, here he is, our king, king of Jerusalem. They laid down all they had. And on Friday, five days later, they shouted, crucify him. The same crowd, the same people. We look at that and think, what fickle people. And yet Palm Sunday reminds us that it's very, very easy to shout Hosanna on Sunday and crucify him on Friday. It's not outside the realms of possibility. As the Stuart Townsend song goes, Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. That's the truth of Palm Sunday. It's very easy for us to to, to sing Hosanna on Sunday and crucify him on Friday. We've taken a break from Jesus' masterclass. It's nice because, you know, we might breathe a sigh of relief. But actually, what Palm Sunday shows us vividly is that that is all too easy to sing Hosanna on Sunday and crucify him on Friday. And finally, and I believe most importantly of all, Palm Sunday is a reminder that Easter weekend is coming. It's a reminder that regardless of this great sense of jubilation, the cross is still looming large. It's a reminder that our sin will nail Jesus to a cross and hold him there until he cries out, it is finished. That's a sobering thought. But on the flip side of that, it's also a reminder that it is finished. The tomb is empty. As I mentioned at the start, I'm, I'm, I don't want to preach an Easter Sunday service, but you, can't, uh, but you can't get away from that. doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what your background is. If you acknowledge Jesus as the King of kings and Lord of lords, then it is finished. Sin's hold on your life is over. You can live in the freedom of being a child of the Most High God. Uh, my good friend David Eden always talks about the importance of knowing that you are a child of God and all that that means. And that is what Palm Sunday reminds us, that we are children of the living God. Yes, the cross is looming large. Yes, Easter Friday is here and there there will be uh, all of that pain and all of that suffering. Yes, that is coming, but it is finished. Freedom is here. Redemption is here. And the kingdom of God is here. On that uh, note, I'm going to hand over to Gregor, who's going to lead us through communion.